so that brings me to the next point as well. I I would love to ask you about your leadership uh, priorities as well. Now, there are... <clears throat> Excuse me. There are a couple of things that we always find equally important in running any business for any business leader, and that would be people, your policy, your profits, and your passion. So, out of these four, if you could kind of um, order them uh, for yourself, what would they be like? Mm. I think now more than ever, we have to lead with passion and it's not just passion um, for your business but it's passion for life in general so and um, I will say this because um, I think it's a very depressing world <laughs> that we're in <laughs> yes um, and and you know I think um, we're not just bosses you know we're not just entrepreneurs but we are also inspirations and we we have to be able to as inspire as well as allow people to be aspired, right, at some point. So that sense of passion that we have is also about leading life to the to its fullest, right? Understanding what all my employees' passions are as well. So mm. actually, interestingly, um, the first question that I ask anybody who comes for an interview, what's your dream? That's my first question. So I, if I interview like a 21-year-old that just graduated, I usually ask the person, what's your dream? That means how do you imagine yourself, let's say at 70 years old, retiring? Is it? So, so where would you be at that point? And it worries me at this juncture that a lot of them don't know. Yeah. So I, and, and I, because I think your life or anybody, right, at any point in your life, it starts with that vision, that end goal. Like, you know, it doesn't matter whether is it you want to climb up the career ladder or you want to have your own business or, uh, you know, volunteering your time and, or, or even sipping coconut under a coconut tree, right? I mean, that's a dream. But a lot of the younger people that I've been interviewing, they don't have anything. And, 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 and this is something that's really worrying for me, which is why as a business leader, as a company leader, as a family leader, as an NGO leader, it's even more important now to have more passion so that your passion can fuel other people's passions because everything else, right, policies will change. And I mean, nowadays, policies change every two hours, right? Policies keep changing. The world keeps changing. And even priorities at some point will keep fluctuating. But if you're leading with your heart, you're leading with some sense of passion or a deep-seated idea of how you want to lead your own life, that doesn't change. Because that fire has to continuously keep burning. It is, as a human being, if you don't have a passion for anything, I think that becomes very sad at some point. So you need to find your own passion or your own calling. Yeah, money-making or not. Yeah. Ah. Agreed, agreed. So uh, that will be your passion first, your people second, of course. Then uh, you've got left with uh, profit and policy. Where do they, where do they lie in the, uh, number three and four? I think once you get the policies right, the profits will stream in. I'm not saying that money is not important, but if profits become the number one of everything, then it's also a question mark. So I think just another um, addition to your question is um, we we started evaluating our internal company values very, very early on because, I mean, we've been through plenty of ups and downs and we've also kind of realized that we cannot just run a business based on a lot of money. Yeah, and uh, and I think this is very timely to even just put this in, right? Um, some of the SMEs out there, if you're listening in, you know, some people actually feel that is it very difficult to put a value or a CSR or ESG into my uh, philosophy? <laughs> of my business because this is something that the the big mncs strive to have right their csr goals what is the esg goals reducing carbon footprint how to be sustainable and things like that these are very big ticket ambitions that a lot of people are feeling that hey actually this one can only be achieved by the big boys but i think this is wrong i think now even as a sole proprietor as an sme or even if you're just ideating what your business is all about I think you need to figure out what's your value proposition internally. That means what's your mission statement. And um, I've shared this before with, with some people. Um, and for those of you who understand Mandarin, right? So actually, Gong Si or Se Hui started out as a cluster of people that came together that served different needs. So the, the barber was there for a reason because he could cut hair well, you know, and a cook was a cook because he could cook well. 
But it's just that in the industrialization over the last hundred over years, we've kind of lost sight or actually what is our role and responsibility in society. But if you are really a business, you are just fulfilling a need in society. And I think that's something that's important to remember. That means you are not just setting up a business for the sake of like making tons of money. I, I would say that that wouldn't have any longevity to it. But if you start a business with a purpose in mind, the profits will somehow come in at some point. Mm, agreed. That's why I remember about seven years ago that tribal culture, right, started the making a real comeback. And I, I, this is precisely why. It's exactly, the fabric of society has changed so much that it became uh, uh, such a commercial entity that we've forgotten a lot more about why, you know, the initial uh, uh, reasons and purposes of businesses, trade, and skill sets have come about. I was actually telling my wife just yesterday that. In this day and age, you better have a blue collar skill up your sleeve because white collar isn't going to be forever. So whether or not you know, I I I better learn how to make a table, carve out a chair, fix a toilet, do something, right? Because if uh, the world goes to shit, you know, like we're living the zombie apocalypse or something like that, we better know how to go and feed ourselves and our families. Uh. that's for sure. You know, yes. and um, th thinking about uh, uh your work and all this, one of the um burning questions that I really have, right, is you've talked about this so often and I think so many people have been asking you about this and multitasking, but I'm not going to ask you how you do it, but I'm going to ask you the second layer of how you do it, meaning to say that in your mind, when you have five things to do, is it more of the discipline to focus on one item and get it out of the way, move to the next one, or are you really thinking about five things at one time? What's going on in there? Okay, this is a female thing. So I think we have many check boxes. I have that boxes, we can you don't have boxes. Yeah, yeah. So, so in my mind, I have plenty of boxes. And in those boxes, there are subdividers, right? So my hubby has a box. My children has a box. Every child has a box. My mom has a box. My grandmother has a box. And then the business has a box. As you can hear, my family will come first because I really feel that if we stabilize our personal life a little bit more and it doesn't bug you as much, then you can actually go on um, to, to your work or your career. And I and I think this is something that a lot of uh, you would actually realize, right? Over the last 12 months, we kind of realized that if we don't stabilize our family, you know, and be able to keep them quiet for a couple of minutes, our meetings will never go on. But that's how um, that's how I envision it. And the second thing is um, I, I have a sense of discipline, um, but that's just my own pet peeve or my idea. I cannot stand it when my inbox still has emails at the end of the day. Yeah. So I have to like either file them up or read them or send a reply. So for any of the emails that's balanced in my inbox, it means that it's my to-do list for the next day. And then, um, yeah, so this is something that, that I do. The same thing for all my WhatsApp messages or the, the, the same thing for anything in my life. So if I don't check off the boxes for that day, um, it would mean that that's something that um, will be left behind for my work to do tomorrow. And my personal philosophy is that whatever that I can do or accomplish in this hour, I will do it within this hour. And it's not done within this day. So that's how that's how I, I think I try to squeeze in everything that I want to do um, effectively um, and efficiently as well. Uh, so that I can take on more projects or responsibilities or one more child, you know, if I wanted to. <laughs> You're going for number yeah. five. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Let's see how things goes. Yeah. My goodness, you uh, you are twenty four seven. That's all I have to say. You know, your day, your day, and your nights are going to be busy if that's the case. The, yes. But the uh, when we talk about the multitasking as well, if you mentioned all these uh, compartmentalization, uh, that's great. You know, and you don't leave work for the next day, or at least if you do, if I did that, I'd have anxiety, like serious anxiety issues. How are you coping with that mentally? Um, I am someone that needs to close up the file for the day. Yeah, and I if think not, that's you just... One. You feel very upset. Yes, and um, so that's why if any of you were writing an email to me or don't be so surprised that at 3 a.m. I will reply you or <laughs> I will say something. So in between my uh, night feeding duties or whatever, looking after the kids at night, you know, so I, I watch them myself at night, right? So... During that time, I will still think of other things or daydream. Uh, I'm now very good at, you know, if I'm like 
doing homework with my kids or something, you know, I that gives me some free space in my mind as well to be able to dream. And I think one's very one very important thing that I've also learned is that um, something that makes me very happy is the ability to be creative. Uh, whether is it from uh, from from any facets of my life, right? So even for the charity, you know, we've been very creative. So a lot of the new ideas actually spur from the moments of me daydreaming. So, and I think by being a little bit more efficient and being tidy and making sure that all my boxes are checked for the day-to-day -day stuff that needs to be done, I, I realized that then that gives me a little bit more time to daydream. If that allows me to dream and that stirs me to then, okay, I need to settle all the the very mundane stuff that's boring stuff that needs to be done so that it gives me something that I can derive pleasure from. So that's that's how I, I, I manage things, yeah. Oh, wonderful. And uh, in previous interviews and also um, quite a number of articles that, that uh, have uh, you've been featured in, you know, has mentioned many stories about your father and your grandfather, you know, starting a business. Again, the ring fencing of the business and getting that done. Um, one of the things that I would like, if possible, for you to share with the audience is that I'm a big believer in generational wisdom because that becomes, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an encyclopedia of knowledge as we go from generation to generation. What's yours that was passed down? So I've never met my grandfather, mm. um, but I hear the stories about him. Right. So one, two, two biggest takeaways, right? So... Um, one of the things that inspired me about my grandfather is that he doesn't leave a single bean behind. So when I say that, I mean it because he came from a generation where he's running a provision shop, right? So every bean that drops on the floor is business to him. Right. But now in our kind of disposable generation, uh, is one bean, you know, I'm just going to dump it away. So that actually inspired me to review how we're looking at food waste right now and why we have so much food waste. It's because we don't appreciate food as much. So for my grandpa, this was one of the things that I took away, whether is it from running the business or whether is it from running the charity standpoint. So I, I share this about him because I he was a very stingy man as well, of course. But secondly is resilience. My, my grandfather was a very resilient man because he, uh, after his first wife passed away, he just came to Singapore, leave his eldest daughter behind, uh, he brought his younger daughter with him to start a new life, you know, uh, on a bum boat, you know, not knowing what Singapore brings, right? And But he actually came here all the way knowing that he has to make something new, you know, with whatever that he had. And he built something from basically nothing. So resilience was, again, the other thing that I took away. Um, and it's just that resilience is making a comeback right now, right? I mean, resilience was the word. But this has always been something that's been in, in our family. And then um, about my dad, um, I, I think I learned from his, um, the failures that he has made. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I think a lot of times people always like, hooray, hooray about the successes, you know, how much money, how much whatever, but nobody has spoken enough about failures. And through my dad, um, I learned from him through the failed stories that he had. So from a complete bankrupt, how did he overcome it? And from a man who had once had everything that he could possibly have, you know, owning tons of buildings, 40 companies in 25 countries, you know, how did he end from there to all the way down at, you know, uh, uh, and, and fighting his own internal struggles and insecurities as well. So no disrespect to my father, but um, I learned through his hardships and, uh, you know, he was from that generation that if my business was going through a tough time, I would put everything that I have, my own personal name, my own personal money, and my own personal house, my own personal unit trust account to the company. Like everything, it's, it's intertwined. And that was the reason, this is one of the biggest takeaways. And um, I, I think for any of the business owners or the entrepreneurs, you would maybe agree with me at some point that, I need to start drawing the line. Yes, business is business. Family is family. It is very important for me to be able to ring fence my family in case anything should happen to the business. I cannot be forsaking everything that I've worked so hard on for the business because business is, um, especially with the pandemic now, right? We all kind of realize that we're part of a much bigger machine, what we call the world or the earth that 
it's not within our control. No matter how good your business is, no matter how best Tokong your policies are, it's not foolproof because we are not in control of the greater universe that we are in. You know, whether is it from God's greater powers or whether is it from the global economy, you know, a lot of these forces are beyond us. And so therefore, what I learned from my dad is that why he greatly failed is that because he couldn't um, dismantle himself from the business. And, right. and you know, Adric, I would share this is that from his mental capacity, he never quite got out of the failed business as well because we never got back to a stage where we were as big as we were. And to him, he felt like he failed as a father, that he didn't give his children something to boast about or he felt that there was a, you know, he wanted to revive the business to a stage where it was everything on the silver platter. You know, I've got something to hand down to my next generation, not a pile of debts. And instead, I had to reverse the counselling for my dad to say that, hey dad, there's so much that you have given to me already. You don't have to give me a bag full of money because you've given me so much more teachings, so much more intergenerational wisdom that I have taken away that I know that I'm going to build on that so that the business that we're going to build on for the years to come is going to be even stronger, maybe more resilient than what it was. You know, learn from the lessons that you have learned and I will also hand this business uh, or this learnings that I've learned to the next generation, not necessarily my children, but for anybody out there who want to listen to the story that I have to tell. Yeah. yeah. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, right? Yeah, exactly. yep. Teach a man a fish, you yeah, feed him for a lifetime. So that's exactly what it really is. And thank you so much for spending you know, this amount of time with us. I've got one more segment that we do with every guest that we have. And it's a great segment because it's just 10 rapid fire questions, right? Uh, for anybody to get to know you real quick. All right. So, uh, Nicole, with the Epic Questionnaire, are you ready? I think so. <laughs> okay, here we go. Question number one, one word that you love the most. Yellow comes to mind. Interesting. One word that you dislike the most? Money. Money. <laughs> the irony. You run a multi-million dollar company. And you're saying Whatever you comes to mind, right? Money. Whatever comes to mind. Okay, so that's... Okay, 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 okay. You got me there. If you could have a conversation with one person, fictional, non-fictional, dead or alive, who would that be? Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew. Interesting. Oh, what's the first question you'd ask him then? What did you have for dinner? Oh, cool. Nice. He was very healthy, by the way. He used to eat very, very clean, to my understanding. Uh, yeah. yeah. We'll have a conversation about health and fitness another time if you've got time. You know, okay. so let's, let's do a segment on that. Anyway, um, what do you say to yourself in the mirror every morning? I'm fat. Oh, you, yeah, you're still going through <laughs> it. No. Yes, on. it's something that's stuck at the back of my mind. It doesn't leave you if any of you suffers from it, right? It's long enough. Um, the, the eating disorder doesn't quite leave you 100%, but that happens. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm a little bit too critical about myself sometimes, but... But then, yeah. how, what do you tell yourself after that then? Hey, I'm a great mom. Ah, okay, that, that's more important. That is super, <laughs> yeah. super, super uh, powerful. Okay, more power to you. Now, name one superpower that you'd like to have. Hmm. I would like to have a stronger sixth sense. <laughs> if there was such a superpower. Too. I already have a very strong sixth sense, but I want to have a stronger sixth sense so that I can you just, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is so common. Though. All the entrepreneurs that I've spoken with all keep telling me, I want to have that. You know, very few of them will actually tell me invisibility. I ask them why. Is yeah. that, oh, it's because uh, I want to hear what people are saying. I'm like, it's the same thing. Okay, yeah. anyway. Anyway, uh, favorite dish to eat? fried kailan with ginger lovely very clean very nice favorite travel spot or the next travel spot you'd like to uh, go to once borders open up I would really I've not been to Egypt actually I would really like to go there and especially I want to go near the Gaza Strip area if I can mm. yeah That's if not the other location like would be Israel yeah Israel or Middle something East, uh, yeah. general that yeah. would be interesting Correct. yeah cool yeah. Something in the arts that you've always wanted to do, but you have yet to do so. Something in the arts. Um, I'm quite arty farty. I've won talent times and all that as well. So uh, 
I actually have wanted to do a 3D art piece um, in my house if I have space, but it, the, the inspiration would be about faces. So I don't know how that will happen, but using maybe food waste or recycled materials, but I really want to do a, a, a huge, maybe a two meter by two meter. That's the, the art piece that I want. That means very street art, very graffiti ah, kind of a feel. Nice. Yeah, but that's the art piece that I want to do. Interesting. Actually, you could start experimenting yeah. with a uh, uh, 3D, sorry, using VR first. Have you yes, done correct. Yeah. Really no, I've not done that yet. Cool. Yeah. I, I cannot do the depth perception. I don't know what's wrong with me. Something's an issue. Um, what does retirement look like to you? Um, working at 90. <laughs> retirement would mean that maybe I'm a great-grandmother or a grandmother at that point. Still ferrying my great-grandkids around. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think I'll be. I'm a workaholic. I, I think that's if there ever is a, you know, my my blood type is B plus, but probably I'm gonna have a workaholic bloodstream. <laughs> but that's that's how I, I think I will have an IV drip on like this, you know, uh, working for life kind of thing. But I, I really, I truly enjoy working, and I'm not just like it's not a piecemeal thing. I, I that's what drives me on a regular basis. I'll be fighting for the next big thing to do. Interesting. Uh, suddenly, I pictured the, the that scene in Masters of the Sea when you talked about uh, that. But anyway, those yeah. who are listening, if you're too young, you don't know. Yeah, actually, just to just to add to that, right? You know, I'm so inspired by Elon Musk's mom, right? Like May Musk, because she she revived her modeling career at seventy something, right? So why can't I do something different at 70, which I don't know what that is, maybe like a singer or something, but completely different uh, job altogether because uh, how I wanted to do is to follow my my kid, my eldest kid to university uh, to study something else, maybe in 10 years time. So, you know, that's something that, yeah. Wow, I would do that to my kid just so I, just so I can embarrass him. It's like, it's just, just... <laughs> for the heck of it um, but I did want to ask you as well you know um, this this is outside of the questionnaire you seem like such a tinkerer I would have expected you to have done your own fashion line and all this by now um, you know um, my first project in fact my first project um, this was in 1998 I, I still have the drafts if any of you are interested to see I wanted to start the Sassy Cheeks Cafe this was before PS Cafe <laughs> The Sassy Cheeks Cafe, where it was a hybrid of um, a cafe, because I love to cook, and a, a fashionista, like a fashion outlet within the shop as well. So it was a hybrid. And I even found the location for it. It was going to be at uh, where Grand Hyatt is, where uh, B&O is right now. So it's everything, you know, people can see in, you know, and importantly, there needs to be a kids cooking class inside also. So this was in 1998. So maybe that might be part of my retirement plan to go back to Possibly. basics. It actually is good. If you did it back then, you would have been ahead of the curve. Uh, but that also <laughs> means that it would be difficult to for the public to uh, to uh, uh, grasp Except, the idea. That's yeah. right. All right. Now, last question. Question number 10. I have no... This is the longest epic questionnaire I've done. I have no idea why I'm so distracted today. Uh, how do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy? Hmm... I'm thinking of my tombstone now. If I ever have one, yeah, that's pretty much the question, actually. What do you want? To, what do you want on your tombstone, apart from uh, you know less algae and moss? I think just an exclamation mark. Not an X. So I, not an X, but I think an exclamation <laughs> mark. So it's like I'm always making an exclamation about something, you know. And I think throughout my twenty odd years in career, NGO, everything. I'm always about making a statement about something. So let the exclamation mark be the mark. Yeah. I think that would be the one that really stands out, you know, having the exclamation <laughs> uh, there. No name, no picture, no dates, nothing. Just an exclamation yeah. mark. So, okay. So whoever is uh, paying tribute in the future, you know who this person is now. All right. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Nicole for sharing. Um, you know, her knowledge and her experience, not just in business leadership, but more importantly, how to be a great human being, how we're helping our fellow man and woman child. Okay, so if you're out there, please, again, go down to foodbank.sg, see if you can pledge something at the end of the day. And also for me, do a little bit of charity as well. Click that like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. All right, with that, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. And Nicole, thank all right, you. stay on the line, yeah? All right, bye-bye.